Hey everybody, welcome into this week's edition of the Top 5 from Tony Spot on Fishing. I'm your host, Tony Krizek, and today we're talking about the top five late fall baits you should be throwing on Lake Michigan and Chicago for late fall salmonoids. What's a salmonoid? It's a mixture of the kings, browns, steelies, cohos, and even some lakers. And we're going to tell you how you can catch them late in the fall. That's this week on Tony's Spot on Fishing. Normally, we wouldn't do a top five about this unless we're talking spawn. But you know what? We understand it's been a heck of a hard run for the kings lately. This year was just a, a rough year. Fish are there. We're seeing them cruising. We're seeing them jumping. We've had some follows. We've had some bumps. Maybe we caught one here or there. Not the numbers in the city that we were hoping for. Up north over the border, sure, no problem. Racine and Kenosha had some great runs this year, as they usually do, even up into Sheboygan. Getting some good reports from the east side of the lake as well. Chicago, not the hottest it's ever been by any means. So we are going to actually exclude using some of that spawn for this top five. We just want to talk about what we can do if we don't have spawn to catch late season kings, the browns, the steelies, the cohos, and yeah, once in a while towards the end of the year, it's, we do get some Lakers. Now we are talking like end of October, first part of November, all the way till the big lake freezes up in the harbors. And even after we list our baits, we're gonna show you the exact harbors and spots where we're catching these fish. So we don't have spawn. What are we gonna float onto a bobber? Easy question to answer. Shrimp, cooked, frozen, peeled shrimp. Just set it up under a slip bobber. Play around with some different depths, sometimes just two feet, three feet. We've even caught them as deep as six to nine. Play around, see where you're gonna get your bites. Now, we usually like running the slip bobber rig with the shrimp, have it set up on the ground off to the side while we're throwing some other moving baits, which we'll talk about momentarily. But that shrimp is a great bait to be using. Now, you can even run a, a crawler or a minnow or anything like that, but it's tough to beat the shrimp under that slip bobber setup. Small to medium size on an octopus hook, and again, play around with your depths. Half a cast out, usually where we'll find more of the, the kings and the brown, or the kings, the cohos, the steelies, and possibly a bonus lake trout. The browns really seem to hug the rocks and the base of the walls. So if we can, sometimes we'll even just let it hang right tight to shore, pick off a brown that way. So the next thing we want to talk about is we get a lot of weird looks. Over the years in tackle shops, uh, all the shops I've worked for, we used to talk about this presentation. And guys would absolutely think I was nutty. But until you try it, you, you got to try it. it. It's unbelievable what this bait catches. We're talking T-tiny, two-inch crappie tube, 30-second ounce jig head. Tip it with a wax worm. Now, we can do a couple things. We can float it under the slip bobber. If we have a nice current bouncing that bait, slowly drifting it side to side or back to us, that works great. Get a little movement to it. If not, we can actually just slowly kind of twitch the rod, work the bait, slow reels, kind of like how we would do four crappies actually. But the salmonoids go crazy for this. One area that we're gonna talk about later on in the show at Burnham Harbor, where the pipe is, we won't even run the slip bobber. We'll actually pip, pitch it out into the currents, just straight lining it. And you can sight fish the salmonoids in the pipe and pick them off with this presentation. Light line, usually by this point, the water is crystal clear. If it's dirtied up, we can still get by running like an eight pound. If you go above six, or if you're not running fluorocarbon, these fish get super line shy really quick, especially when that water's crystal clear. So we run it on our swan rods, our nine foot sixes, rods like that. So we have plenty of give to the rod. We can still work these fish and land them with the lighter line when these fish get super line shy like that. I'm telling you, that little 30 second ounce jig head with the white or glow, white glow, either one pearl, anything white in color, they just go nuts for it, tipped with a wax worm. So we've talked about our stationary rods and our jigs. 
Now let's actually talk about some of the baits that we can throw. And the first thing we want to talk about is from Storm, the hot and tot. Now we use the larger size, the 07 size. And what's nice, if you've never thrown a hot and tot, it's got a real wide vo uh, wobble to it, high vibration, a lot of flash, but it also kind of does this S curve as it's going through the water. It'll sway back side to side and it really helps trigger a lot of these fish to strike. Great bait, both lakeside and inside the harbors. If you have to throw into a stiffer wind though, they don't go far. So if you're facing a, a cross breeze, sometimes that bait will slide off on the side for you pretty bad. If you gotta try to muscle it out into a breeze right in your face, they are light baits. They're not gonna throw too well, but if you can get a uh, wind at your back or a calm day where there's no wind, firing it off on our traditional salmon rods, a medium action salmon rod eight foot six or a nine foot, no problem throwing those baits at all. And that wide wobbling action, the searching action, really produces a lot of strikes late in the year. You hear us talk about the magwort all the time for kings. We're actually downsizing this time of year to the original smaller wigglewort. Hard vibrating action on this bait, loud rattles to it. The wigglewort does come with a crosslock snap attached to it. We want to tie to that snap because that's actually going to give the freedom to get that bait to really swing and vibrate. So tie directly to that snap that comes with the bait and you'll be good to go. Decent weight to it, it works a lot better in the windy conditions and it's just something about that downsized, tighter wiggle, the high vibration and the rattles really gets those fish going. All the salmonoids will chew that thing all day long. Um, as with the hot and tot, this bait as well, blue and chromes, natural patterns, golds work well. Um, also red. A lot of people think just red in the spring for the cohos, but the red late in the fall like this, oh man, that is some good stuff. Make sure you're throwing a wiggle wart. Now finally, what we want to talk about in our bait selection is spoons. And we're going to actually cover a few of them here. We're talking everything that pretty much we've used already during the fall king run. K.O. wobblers, little Cleos, crocodile spoons, and the moonshine spoons. And I have a variety of colors with you blue chrome, green chrome, golden orange, golden nickel, uh, orange and nickel, uh, if you're gonna be at night, because we can still fish at night for these fish, um, the glow patterns, blue glow, green glow, uh, any of the glow patterns of the moonshine. And also on those moonshines, we even run not only the one that looks like the kale wobbler, but that full size one as well, which is kind of essentially more designed as like a pike spoon, very similar to a daredevil, the steelhead love that bait. Agent Orange and Bloody Nose especially, those are two great colors for the steelies out there. They absolutely love them. And then, like I say, a wide range of colors and all those sizes of spoons, and you'll be set up perfectly to go catch these fish. So, without further ado, let's talk about some of the harbors that we love fishing for these fish and the exact spots of where we can catch them. Now the first thing we're going to talk about is Montrose Harbor. Now you may notice a lot of Montrose looks pretty similar to where we talked about for Fish in the Kings. The first thing we want to look at is the horseshoe area. Gives you great access to deep water. Uh, browns especially love hanging out there. We have caught steelies and we have seen the occasional lake trout later in the year out there because we can access slightly deeper water. As we come back south, that area just before the walkway that takes you out to the horseshoe, it's got a nice deep washout right there. And I'll tell you what, that's one area that we've done really well on the hot and tot. Those fish really get going. If I'm fishing that spot late in the year, that's what I'm throwing right in that spot is the storm hot and tot. And as we come down around the point back towards that harbor mouth, that whole shoreline, we can walk and cast and cover all that water, the mouth of the harbor as well, the jetties. And then you can see highlighted by the yellow, the inside portions of the harbor where those fish will tend to migrate and hang out in. And it's all good water in there to throw a mix of the bobbers, the jigs, crankbaits, spoons, cover all that water. You'll definitely find some fish at Montrose. Next harbor we're gonna discuss is Diversity Harbor. 
And as you can see, this is pretty much spot on exact how we fished it for the Kings. To the north, just to the north of the mouth of the harbor, that point down around the bend, that whole shoreline there, good deep water. Fish that are trying to come into the harbors, they actually come in to the wall, stage there, and then turn and head south towards the mouth of the harbor. So it's a good area to intercept them. Of course, the mouth of the harbor, same thing. We can intercept those fish as they start to enter the harbors and that shoreline just south of the mouth, all good water. It's a little bit shallower, but a lot of cohos are definitely caught off of that southern shoreline just south of the mouth. Inside, again, great place to throw our wiggle warts and our hottentots, but also probably one of my favorite areas to float shrimp uh, or even that waxworm. There's always good current coming towards or from the mouth as they'll actually push water on the bubbler to regulate the water levels inside the harbor. So we always have a good current flow to drift that inside section. Probably my favorite area. Lastly, we want to talk Burnham Harbor. Now this is the harbor where things kind of change a little bit as far as compared to that King Show. We're going to start fishing basically the whole bend and point area around the, the Adler Planetarium. And we can cast there, we hit some nice deep water, get a mixture of the steelies, cohos, browns. Again, good spot for the occasional laker. And follow it all the way down to just about the pipe area. That whole section in yellow there, we can go along casting. Now before we talk about the pipe, we'll even talk about one more good area just west, right around the Shedd Aquarium to the mouth of Monroe Harbor. Now it's a little bit bigger chunk rock area on the east side of the Shedd Aquarium. So it's one thing you'd have to contend with when you're netting these fish. Just be aware of the big boulders that are down there. They're massive. You can't miss them. And we can work all the way around inside to Monroe Harbor, the mouth there. Probably one of my favorite areas. If I can guarantee you one area you're going to find a brown, it's going to be right by the shed there. They love sitting alongside those boulders and feeding on stuff that gets blown out, be it the gobies, alewives, whatever, even craws. Browns eat everything. They're the garbage disposals of Lake Michigan. So that is a great section for the browns. Now in the red section here, we're highlighting is the pipe area. And that is how they regulate water levels inside Burnham Harbor. Water will flow in and flow out. We can fish both lakeside or harbor side. Occasionally you'll find fish on both sides. Sometimes they're gonna be stacked on one side more than the other. Check them both out. You'll be able to sight fish these fish. And that is the spot where that tube jig is perfect. There is nothing else you need to bring other than that tube jig setup with your wax worm on your noodle rods, your spawn rods, and you will catch them all day long. So there you have it, folks. If you didn't have success in the king run, don't fret. There's still time to get out there for more of these various salmonoids on the lakefront. And even uh, if you've never done any of this before, it's a great opportunity to get involved on some Lake Michigan fishing. All good eating fish, you know, the younger kings that are going to be up, the ale lice are up, so the kings are there, the cohos, steelheads, browns, lakers, they're all there. And they are a blast to catch. They're all tasty. They can be prepared a bunch of different ways. So definitely, even if it's your first time, never done this before, it's a great time to get on it. We wanted to release this just a hair early to make sure everybody was geared up and ready. Usually this bike gets going really good at the end of October, first part of November, and it'll run all the way till things freeze up. Hey, if you need to get stocked up on this gear, we invite you to check out our Amazon links to our Amazon accounts where you can purchase all the products we've talked about here. We've got rods, reels, the lines we use, the baits, ropes for stringers, coolers, extended handle nets. You need it, we're your one-stop shop to get set up and you can help support Spot On Fishing and help us to continue bringing you these great shows each and every week. We hope everyone enjoyed this program. We hope everyone has a great fall out on Lake Michigan. I'm sure we'll run into a lot of our viewers out there this fall chasing these salmonoids ourselves. But that's it for this week, folks. Once again, my name's Tony Krizak. We'll see you next time on Tony's Spot on Fishing.